recorder is started. And then we can take a look at the program. There we go. All right. So I'm not even going to Canvas, you know, because there's really, we do have a lab today, okay? So today's lab is also on structures so that you can get some ex additional exposure of how to work with structures. So today's entire focus is on structures. All right, so on the screen here, okay, I have, <clears throat> I'm going to rename the assembly implementation to something else. This is from kind of years ago, so I can work on this from scratch, okay? So we'll take a look at the C code, and we'll take a look at the assembly implementation. We'll work on the assembly Im implementation step by step, okay? So here we have the program that we are gonna be focusing on. Um, it is in some way similar to your homework assignment, and in some other way, not exactly the same. So we're gonna take a look at the C code. We have a structure definition. This one is a little bit simpler compared to the one that you have as your homework assignment. Uh, the structure has two members. One is V for value, and then the other one is next, which is a pointer to the structure X itself, okay? So it doesn't have to point to <clears throat> a specific thing. You know, the pointer can be a null pointer, which means we're at the end of something. And then over here on lines you know, 9, 10, and 11, we have three initialized global variables. They are named N1, N2, and N3. This is N3. So the way I have it initialized means you know, 2 is going to the member V, and 0, which is null, is going to the member next. And then we have N2 basically having 5 as a value. But then the next is pointing to N3. And that's why I have the, it has the address of N3 as a global variable. And then you know, something very similar in the case of M1. <clears throat> and then we have main here. Uh, main has a few things in it. It has a local variable, which is a pointer. It points to a struct X. It has a local array of three bytes. It has a local variable I, which is just an integer unsigned. PTR is initialized to the address of N1. And then we have a loop. Uh, I is initialized to zero. We have a loop that we stay in as long as PTR is not null. And then inside the loop, we have three statements. The first one is array I, bracket, you know, I you know, gets the value of whatever PTR is pointing to. We increment I, okay, let me just change the indentation. And then PTR gets the next of the PTR, okay? So this is um, line 24 maybe the most mysterious part, okay? It's like, so what are we doing here? The way you think about this is to look at the assignment statement on line 24, and then you always evaluate the right-hand side, and then use whatever is on the right-hand side, the value of the right-hand side, to change the left-hand side. The fact that they are both referring to PTR should not bother you at the least, because you know, the order of evaluation is we always evaluate the right-hand side first. Once the right-hand side is evaluated, we don't care how it is expressed. We just have to say, okay, where do we store that value from the right-hand side? And that's the job of the left-hand side is to specify where do we store that. And that's the entire program. So first of all, are there any questions about the C code? Because you know, I can try to address all those questions about the C code before we try to run the C code. And then once we understand what the C code is doing, then we'll go ahead and implement the assembly code. Are there any questions about the C code? Yes, so zero, you mean on line nine? Yeah, so this is basically the same thing as what we usually refer to as null. Uh, but in order to get the null um, macro defined, you have to pound include certain um, header files. And standard integer dot h does not include the definition of null. So a simple zero would work here as well. Yes? Yep, and therefore the name LList, which is a linked list you know, uh, program. All right, so once a, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I thought you had a question. That's okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run the C code first, okay? And then we'll try to use the GDB debugger 
to tell us as much as possible what the program is supposed to do. What is it doing to array? Um, how do we access you know, PTR? How does PTR changes over time? Um, how does that relate to how N1, N2, N3 are initialized? And so on. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on the effect of the program and use GDB to help us understand that first. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do. Um, I am going to kind of peel off or start another terminal just so that we can look at the code and also GDB at the same time. So I'm going to put this you know, window over here to run GDB and bump up the font size a little bit like so. All right, so we're going to compile the code, gcc-g-o, llist, llist.c. <clears throat> and then we can now do a gdb llist and list the program. And then we can now set up a breakpoint. So I'm going to set up a breakpoint at the very beginning, which is on line 18. And then we run the program. So on line 18, you know, I know, you know, because of the syntax highlighting, it's a little bit hard to read. PTR gets the address of N1. So on the command line, I have a few things I can do. I can print N1 itself, which shows us that N1 has V as a member, having a value of 16. And then next is an address of some kind. And GDB is smart enough to understand, hey, I know this address. It is the address of N2. Okay. So that means you know, N1 has the next member being the address of N2. It gives me a way to kind of follow the chain, so to speak, to get to the next item. Okay, very cool. Um, and then we can also say, okay, but where is M1 itself? M1 itself is over here. And you can also see you know, the um, ordering of how we define the global variables also determine you know, the addresses. So you can see how you know, N1, which is defined last, has the highest address, and N2 has a smaller address, has a lower address. <clears throat> All right, so we can now single step, because right now we are on line 18. So when we single step, we get to line 19, which is a simple thing. You know, I just get initialized to zero. And then we are now getting into the loop. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is to say, okay, what is PTR? PTR is not null. That's all that matters when we are on line 20, because you know, if, no, if PTR is null, which it means it's zero, then it's, for, uh, it's time for us to exit the loop and we are done. So what, we do we, what do we do next? Okay, so single step. So the next line to execute is line 22. It's easier to read it on the left-hand side just because the syntax highlighting makes it really kind of hard to <clears throat> read the output from GDB. I can potentially change the color scheme. I'm not, but I don't want to waste time to do it. All right, so line 22 has, is an assignment you know, operation. So we are trying to get to the member V of the structure that PTR is pointing to. That becomes the, the value of the right-hand side. We want to use it to update array bracket I, and I is zero at this point. So we are really just trying to update the first element of the array called array itself. <clears throat> so now we can kind of anticipate what it's going to do. So first of all, we want to say, okay, what is PTR itself pointing to? So it's pointing to a structure where V, member V is a 16, is what 16? So that means you know array brackets I should be should become 16. And we also want to know what I is. I already said it's a zero, but we can confirm that. So now when I single step, um, you know, then we can go back and check what is in array. And we can see um, in array, we have um, backslash 0, 2, 0 here as the first element. You guys go like, well, what is that? I thought we were supposed to have 16. Well, that really is 16 in octo. In other, in other words, in base 8, 0, 2, 0 is representing what we know as 16. Does that make sense to you? Because it means we have none of 1, 2 of 8, and none of 64. OK, well, that does add up to 16 to me. Yep, question? OK, so now we are done with uh, line 22. We go to line 23, which is just adding 1 to i. So that's not really mysterious. i becomes 1. 
So the next statement is also going to be, it might look a little confusing, but it does not, it's not, it should not be confusing when you say, okay, we are gonna evaluate whatever is on the right-hand side and use that to update whatever is on the left-hand side. In other words, our focus is just the right-hand side first. So we are really asking, what is the member next of the structure that PTR is pointing to? Well, we, I showed it a little bit earlier already. It is this particular address. So what are we gonna do with that? Well, we're gonna use that to update PTR itself. Yes? Say again? I thought you were asking Oh, okay, sorry. <clears throat> so we're gonna use that to update PTR itself. So when this is all done, when, when line 24 is all done, then PTR would end up being this address, which means it is the address of N2. So it was initialized to be the address of N1, and now it becomes the address of N2. So let me single step, and then we look at the PTR again, and now it is the address of N2, whereas before it is the address of N1. So um, that's how this loop is going to uh, get this job done. So we, I'm just gonna fast track the whole thing until PTR is null. I think it is not null, this is N3. So this is the last iteration. And then after this, PTR is null, which means we're gonna get out of the loop. Okay, single step. And now we're out of the loop on line 26, which is you know, how we get out of main. But at this point, we can take a look at a few things. First of all, what is I? I is three, okay? And then the next thing is, what is PTR? It is null. And the last one is, what is in the array? And it becomes um, basically 16, five, and two. Where do we, how do we get those values? Um, we got the 16, the five, and the two here. In other words, we go through every single thing in the chain, okay, which is also called a linked list, and then we get the value of every single node within the chain and copy those values into the array. So this does resemble a little bit of what your program, the Traverse program is supposed to do, except it is not you know, exactly the same, but it has a lot of resemblance to you know, what your program is supposed to do. All right, so I'm gonna pause here, okay, and see if there are any questions. So this time I am actually asking. Yep, go ahead. Okay, you go first. Okay, I saw your hand first. Yep, go ahead. Um, <laughs> yes, I am recording. Go ahead. I see. Okay, okay. Yes, we are recording, and I am going to double check that the screen is good. Yep, it, everything is good. Audio is good. It's ongoing. <clears throat> cool. Anything else? Are there any other questions about the C code? Any questions about the effect of the C code, what we are observing in the C code? Okay, I don't see any questions. All right, so I will share these, you know, these files with you after class. So you might want to consider doing the same thing that I suggested on Monday and a few other days <clears throat> in this semester, which is basically to go back and comment, okay, you know, the code, especially the one in assembly. Some of you may also want to consider commenting the C code if you have not been programming in C for some time. You know, the C code itself may require a little bit of commenting so that you can remind yourself what it is doing. All right, so we are now back to the assembly code. I just need to turn this monitor a little bit to me. Um, and then we'll do the usual thing, okay? LDID with a zero to quote unquote initialize the stack pointer. Uh, LDIA.6 plus. That's our return address, document D, STDA, pushing it on the stack, JMPI to main, which is calling main. And when main comes back, we have nothing else to do, okay? We just put a halt here. So that becomes our usual entry code you know, for the programs that we are writing now. And then we can, um, I can define you know, X right now. So X underscore V being the first member of the structure is going to be at a displacement or offset of zero bytes from the beginning of the entire structure. And that's why it's defined to be a zero. X underscore next is going to be <clears throat> um, 
x underscore v one plus because x underscore v is where we can find member v this one is referring to the size of v itself so when you add these two it becomes your where we can find the next member of the structure which is next and now we have x underscore size <clears throat> being x underscore next which is the last member of the entire structure plus the size of next which is just one byte it is just one byte because it is a pointer okay so any pointer in ttp is only going to take up one byte even if it's pointing to some gigantic thing the pointer itself is only one byte because that's all we need to identify one of the 256 locations in ram all right so that is that and now we are in main so this time main has got a few things in it because we got a, quite a few local variables here <clears throat> so now we have to kind of imagine what should the stack what should the frame look like when we are all set up in main the return address is going to be the, the thing that we expect at the highest address because you know, it is called from the entry point and it does not have any parameters so the return address is at the highest location and then we can now allocate for the local variables so the ordering of the local variables is not super important um, except I'm just going to do it like this, where the first local variable is going to be at the lowest location. Now, whether you want to do it this way or exactly the reverse of this or just some random way to do this, it's up to you. Okay, you know, um, just you just need to be consistent. So I want the frame to look like this, but at the entry point of main, the stack pointer is really here because that's all the caller could set up for the main function. So that means I have to change it all the way down to here. You guys go like, okay, well, that's pretty easy. Decrement D, decrement D, decrement D, that should do it. Well, the answer is yes, okay? You can do it that way, but it's not the best way to do it because if you were to do it that way and I change the program a little bit, I need some more local variables, then you're gonna have to redo all the decrement D and the, all the increment D um, to deallocate the, the, the space for local variables. So the way that I'm gonna do it is to go like, Okay, so of the entire frame, PTR is at an offset of zero from where the stack pointer points to. The next one is array, which is going to be main PTR one plus. So the one in the one plus is referring to the size of the pointer itself. Okay, because you know, now I know where to find the beginning of the entire array. <clears throat> the next line is gonna be for local variable I. So this one is main underscore array but this time it is three plus because the array has three elements each element being a byte so that means you know where I can find I is going to be three bytes away from where I can find array <clears throat> and then finally we can get to the return address but typically we don't really care about that okay so you know just for documentation purposes you know we can say okay if i need to find where the, the return address is that's where we can find it all right so now we have all the labels almost and we have one more thing that i want to define which is main lvs okay which is main underscore i one plus which is basically the same thing as return address can someone remind me what is lvs what does it stand for Okay, I'll give you a hint. L is local. Well, local, variable local variable size. That's right. Okay. So instead of typing you know, all those you know, letters, I'm just going to use the abbreviation, which is just LVS. So the idea of using LVS is you can now have a very consistent way of allocating and deallocating for the local variables. So to allocate, I just do a LDIA with main LVS and we subtract that from um, the stack pointer. So this way I'm moving the stack pointer down by in this case, the you know, five bytes and those five bytes are allocated for the local variables. I'm not pushing, okay? In other words, I am not specifying the actual value to go into those five locations. I'm simply saying, oh, save those five locations on the stack for me. I got use for those five locations later, okay? So when the program is done, I need to do the exact opposite. So I'm just gonna do the lazy thing of you know, copying and pasting, but changing the subtract to add because I need to deallocate 
those five locations before I return to the caller. So now at this point, I can do LBD, BD, increment D, ST, oh, no, JMP, B. That's the typical return sequence you know, with those three instructions. So now the call frame is all set up, okay? By the time we get to line 27, the stack does look like what line 14 to line 17 is trying to describe. Are we doing okay so far with the program up to this point? So at this point, I only have the code to set up the main you know, uh, frame, um, and I have not specified a single line of code at all inside main. <clears throat> if you have Reefer Swap Spider already set up, I would just run this, okay, and just make sure that everything behaves you know, the same way that it's supposed to. So I'm going to do that because I want you guys to kind of have a habit of you know, testing your program you know, frequently. So this way, if you do run into any problem, you will find that problem early on before you write you know, too much code. Um, okay, so I think I did my favorite thing, which is forgetting to save the file. The one reason why a GUI tool can be helpful. <clears throat> All right, so this also means I need to bring up the assembler. So let me search for the right assembler for this class. This is one, two, five. Okay, I'm looking at the course code, the section number. And I'm gonna move this screen over and maximize. There we go, gonna go to the assembler. There we go. And we are already on the analysis tab. Okay, so this is what the program is doing up to this point. Uh, we got the usual entry code, no op, initialize the stack pointer. These three instructions push the return address, go to main, and inside main, okay, this is at main already because I can tell because of the line number. So this is in main already. I am decrementing the stack pointer by five so it went from FF to FA and do absolutely nothing at that point and then increment or change the stack pointer and increase it by five again. And then I do the usual thing of returning, you know, this is the return address of uh, zero nine as the location. I continue execution at that location, zero nine, and then is a halt instruction. The stack pointer is back to zero, zero. So the program is okay, okay? It doesn't do a single thing, okay? But I can confirm that I'm you know, you know, allocating the space on the stack correctly and all that stuff. So I would kind of suggest that you know, when you write your program you know, for this class, you, know, you would follow kind of the same thing because this way, you know, if you do make a mistake, you know, you, it's easier to find that mistake and fix it. All right, so now that this is done, we go back to the program and then we just kind of go like, okay, so what are we going to do now? Okay, because, you know, this is where we can insert the code into the program. And the first thing we need to do is line 18 of the C code, which is just, you know, okay, take the address of M1 and put it into the local variable pointer. So the significance of this line is we have two different types of variables in this case. N1 is a global variable, which means it is statically allocated. And I don't have it done yet you know, in the assembly code. And then PTR, the pointer, is a local variable. We can only find it on the stack at a certain offset from where the stack pointer points to. So the way we find N1 and the way we find PTR are different. So before we can go any further, now we have to go back and do the initialize the variable N3, N2, and N1. And the way we do this in assembly code is just N3 byte 2, which is member V of the structure corresponding to N3, and then the byte 0, which is the next pointer corresponding to um, the member next. And then N2 is very similar. We just have a byte 5 in this case, and then a byte N3 without the ampersand, because the label N3 is already the address of where the byte 2 is you know, on line 14. So the label itself is already the address 
when you are programming in assembly. And we just have N1 left, okay? So N1 is uh, byte uh, 16, which is B, and then byte N2, and that is the member next. All right, so this part is very similar to your program, to your homework assignment. Um, it's just that you know, in your homework assignment, each structure has two pointers. So instead of pointing to the next item, it has a left pointer and a right pointer, okay? <clears throat> All right, so with these additional definitions, I can now go back here and try to accomplish you know, that one single line of line 18. So the left-hand side is easy. That's all I need. Because remember, with a global variable, the label corresponding to the global variable is representing the address of the global variable already. So N2 is already referring to where I can find the structure N1 so I don't need to do anything else, okay? This is the entire right-hand side. The left-hand side is a local variable, which means it is living on the stack. So that means you know, it, the label itself, okay? I'm gonna put it into a B. So that means the label itself is a symbolic name of the offset of where I can find pointer relative to where the stack point is pointing to. So, but that's the whole reason why I have the definitions of the labels from line 29 all the way to line 33, because this way, if I define the labels correctly, I can just refer to the labels at this point. <clears throat> so if I add uh, the stack pointer to register B, now I have the address of PTR, and um, that's all we need, okay? Now we just need a store, because I need to change the local variable PTR to whatever the right-hand side is specifying, which is really just the label N1, okay? So I'm suspecting this is working, okay? But if this is not working, okay, if I make a mistake here, that means the rest of the program is not gonna work. So it makes sense to me to spend maybe another minute or so just to make sure that this part is in fact working. So to show that this part is working, um, I'm gonna start up my little tablet thing on the side. Um, CRCP5. <clears throat> All right. Because it really helps to have a picture of what the stack should look like and which location should have what value. <clears throat> so let me switch back to the default color. Okay. So this is the stack. We know this is going to be the return address back to main. Um, from main back to the entry point. And this is location FF. The next one down is going to be you know, the frame. And we already have a somewhat of a picture you know, inside um, the code here. So we know the return address is here, I is here, array is down here, and then PTR is down here. So I'm just gonna copy that you know, on my tablet. So I'm not gonna, I cannot show you at the same time because I need to refer to the screen at this point. Okay, so this is PTR. All right, so now we can switch to that view. So array is taking up, um, huh. So, okay, that's I, it's just bad penmanship on my part. This is array bracket zero. It's the first element of array. This is array bracket one. And this one here is array bracket two. So that is how an array works. It really is just a bunch of the things of the type that the array is of, okay? And in this case, it's pretty easy because each item is only one byte wide, so that means each item is only gonna take up one byte on the stack. But I would like to kind of point out the actual addresses, FC, FB, FA, okay? So that means when the first, when line 18 of the C code is done, okay, you can see the C code on this side. So that means PTR at location FA should now point to N1. So we're expecting the address of N1 to be here. Now, where is N1? Well, that kind of depends, right? That's the whole job of the assembler is it can figure it out for me. Otherwise, I have to do all the counting myself, which is tedious and you know, error prone. 
So now we can go ahead and run the code and see whether this is happening or not. So I go back to this prompt, just kind of up arrow, press the enter key. <clears throat> and then switch back to the browser here. And the focus here is the, hmm. All right. Oh, I, I know why, okay, my favorite thing to do, which is forgetting to save the file first. All right, so we're gonna save the file first. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I was supposed to save the file without closing the uh, that particular tab, but I did. Um, so now it's saved, let's go ahead and run it again. All right. So now go back, <clears throat> and we can see how the program is a little bit changed. Location FA is getting 0E. So the big question is, is 0E really the address of N1? How do we check that? We go to the Assemble tab. So the Assemble tab, you know, give you a listing. This is where we define N1, and it is actually the label of the next, whatever location is right next to the definition which is 0E. So this is how we can confirm that, yep, we did get the address of M1 and put it into the local variable PTR. All right, so I'm gonna pause and see if there are any questions. Nope, okay, all right, so we're gonna proceed. <clears throat> and we are gonna like finish a few more initialization. So the next one is just you're putting a zero into I I'm pretty sure we can get that done now. Okay, we got we got that whole pattern done. Okay. <clears throat> so when you're studying for this class, okay, do not, and I re-emphasize, do not try to memorize the sequences. Because you know these this kind of sequence is just one way of getting this done. Okay. So what you should be focusing on is what is accomplished and how this particular sequence of instructions is getting it done. But it doesn't mean this is the unique only pattern to get it done. So you have to kind of train your mind and understand that in the exam, I can give you alternative sequences to get the same thing done, and you have to be able to understand that. <clears throat> All right, so this one is pretty easy, okay? This is the left-hand side, this is the right-hand side, which is just a zero, and then on the right-hand side, we can just kind of use the same pattern. <clears throat> there we go. So now your I should get a value of zero. So if you're concerned and go like, I'm not really sure that this is getting done. Okay, fine. Let's run it. Okay, before we run it, I have to remind myself to save the file first. Let me go back here. What I do need is a macro definition in VI so that you know, I can have a command in VI and it, it will automatically save and run you know, River Spider you know, in that particular order. Pretty sure it can be done, but <clears throat> just need some time to do it. All right, so the assembler is taking its sweet time to do it. <laughs> All right, so now we switch back to the assembler and go back to the analysis tab. And we can observe that location FE is getting zero. The question is, is that where we're expecting I, okay? So now we go back to the picture that I drew a little bit earlier, and you can see how FE is indeed where we expect local variable I to be, and it's getting a value of zero, okay? All right, so now we get back into the program, okay? And let's see, there we go. And now we have a loop, okay? Now we are ready to implement from line 20 to line 25. So here's the thing, you know, here's the, my question, is how are you gonna do this? Because a control structure, you know, is a little bit more complex than just assignment statements. So if, I, if, it, it, was, if it was up to me, I will implement the control structure later. In other words, I'm just gonna say, Let's just test to make sure that we can go through one iteration and get it done correctly. Because if I can get the body of the loop done once correctly, 
then I can go like, okay, so now we just have to specify the code so that it can do it multiple times. Does that make sense? Because if you try to specify the control structure first, then if you specify the control structure in the wrong way, you cannot know until you're done with the code in the inside because the condition to get out of the loop depends on the side effect of what is inside the loop. So that's why the ordering of testing, implementing and testing this code is to, is to test whatever is inside the control structure, then you know, implement the control structure itself. Is that okay? All right. So that means I'm not going to implement the loop itself. I might want to use indentation to remind myself that this, all, this is all inside the loop, or I can just use comment here. Okay, so we'll just say while PDR, and over here is and while. Now, I know in C and C++ there's no such thing as an and while, but I do want to indicate where the end of the while loop is, just in case you know, when, when the, by the time we want to implement the control structure, I know where to put that unconditional branch to go back to the beginning. All right, so we are now concerned about line 22. Okay, so we'll take a look at line 22. For anything that looks complex, break it down first. Okay, don't look at something that looks complex and be and feel overwhelmed, because what you need to do is to think, is to break it up. It's like, okay, I'm going to handle the left hand side and right hand side separately. It's always the right hand side first because it provides the value to update the left hand side. So I'm just going to forget the entire thing here. I'm just looking at this thing here which is asking for what is member V, what is the value of member V of the structure that PTR is pointing to. So by spelling out what we're looking for, hopefully that will also give you a clue of what do we need first. Um, I don't need to know where V is until I know where the structure is. I can only know where the structure is if I access pointer as a local variable. So the first thing I need is pointer, okay? So we say LDI um, B with main underscore PTR add BD. That would be the address of the local variable PTR, which is not exactly what we want because we want the value of the local variable. So I'm just gonna pause a little bit here does everybody understand the differences between the address of PTR versus the value of PTR? Okay, all right. So I just want to confirm because you know that's that is important. Okay, so I look at this and go like, hmm. Well, I need to know. Remember what where PTR is? You know, in the near future. The answer is no. Okay, well, well but in that case, I can overwrite here register B with whatever register B is pointing to. In other words, I'm dereferencing the address of PTR, which will get, get me the value of PTR, which is a pointer to a structure, which, is also mean, which also means now we have the address of a structure in register B. And now I can start to worry about which part of the structure do I want? Oh, it's member V that we want. So now we utilize the offset, the symbolic name for the offset. I have to use another register for this. Uh, register A is fine. Um, it's X underscore V. This is the offset of where we can find member V from the beginning of the entire structure. So now I put it into register A and then I add A and B. Which way I want to add? Eh, doesn't really matter in this case. So I'm just going to add you know, from B to A. So now register A has the address of member V of the structure that is pointed to by PTR. Okay, the way I said that is very specific. Okay, There's, there should be no ambiguation of what I just described. Okay, and it is important to kind of say it out loud and be able to document it as such. All right, so we have the address, which is also not what we want because I don't see an ampersand, you know, in with parentheses around the entire thing. So that means, okay, we need to dereference that also one more time because now we have the actual value of member V of the structure that PTR is pointing to. Are we good so far? Up to line 55 of the code. Okay. Now, if you want to test the code, you can. You can just put a halt instruction here so that by the time it halts, you can check whether register A has 16 
or what it, you know, hexadecimal six, hexa, the hexadecimal version of 16, which is one zero in it, okay? So the question is, should I do that? Should I test it? Well, since it's not going to be very expensive as an operation, I go like, why not? Let's test it. Because otherwise, if you don't test it now, and it doesn't do what you think it should be doing, it's just going to come back and bite you later, right? So might as well test it as soon as possible, you know, because it doesn't take that much time to test it. So now we switch back to, oh, okay, I just went past one tab over here. And now we are asking, was the last operation, the update to register A, a one zero? That's basically the only thing I'm looking for. So we just keep scrolling down and go like, yep, confirmed. All right, so this is how I would approach writing code you know, in this class for the next, what, week and a half or so. <clears throat> is really to go slow, okay, and understand what is supposed to happen and run the debugger, you know, which is you know, the tracing mechanism, and verify that the program is doing what it's supposed to be doing you know, with only a few lines at a time. Okay, so you add a few lines, test it, add a few lines, and test it. It serves multiple purposes, okay? It's not just a programming technique, but it is also a way to quote unquote study. Because if you try to lump like 20 or 30 lines you know, at the same time, and then the program doesn't work, one, you're gonna get frustrated, okay? Because you have no idea why it is not working. Two, you're not going through this process as many times as you would otherwise be doing, because every time I do this, I'm reinforcing my understanding of what I should be doing on the stack, what is in each variable, what is in each register, what the registers are doing. So by doing this in a repeated fashion, I'm actually studying. This is how I would study for this class at this point. All right, so switching back to here, um, we can now continue the program because I have just verified just the right-hand side of line 22. I mean, is that a lot of work? Yes, it is a lot of work, okay? You know, there's no easy way around assembly language programming. It is not, it's not an easy class. Okay, so now I have to uh, change the left-hand side. So I got the right-hand side done already. It is in register A. Now if you look at the left-hand side, I go like, what is that? We are trying to access a particular element of the array, okay? So the first thing you need to get to is where do I find the array to begin with, right? So can someone tell me whether array is a local variable or is it a global variable? Because that really makes a big distinction of how I can find the beginning of the array. So answer, local, okay, very good. So that means I'm use, gonna use the same technique as before, LDI, I can reuse B and C at this point. This is the offset of where I can find the first byte of the array. This is uh, the actual, address of the entire array. So at this point, I have the address of the entire array in register B, but I also need one more thing because I need to know what I is. Because I is, local variable I is serving as the index of you know, how we want it. It specifies which element we want to get to. So I need to know the value of I as well. So that means we're gonna have Another thing like this, okay, similar, but I cannot use register B or register A. Um, at this point, add CD, and this time I need a dereference so that you know, I actually get to the value of I. So at this point of time, I have the address of the array in register B, I have the value of I in register C. What should I do at this point? not load because I don't want to destroy register B because register B, okay, so in terms of this picture, what we have at this point is register B is pointing to this location. Register C is specifying which one of the three locations or which one of the three elements we want to access. Yep, we add them, ex exactly. So we just have to add, in this case, there's no multiplication involved because every element of the array only has one byte, okay? So there's no multiplication involved in this case. All right, 
So which way I add doesn't really matter. I can add, you know, C, B, or B, C, you know, as long as I get the sum is okay. So I'm just going to do an add C, B in this case. So now register B, excuse me, register C is now the address of the element that I need to access, okay? So that means we have the left-hand side handled already. It, we, we know the location. So the, what is left to do is a single store because you know, that's the whole point of an assignment operation is we are storing the right-hand side to what the left-hand side is specifying. And the right-hand side is in register A, okay? So that's what we're suspecting you should happen, okay? I, I'm suspecting this code will get the job done. So once again, do a halt here, okay? Because I'm not sure, because I just added what? Line 50 to line 63, so approximately what, you know, 14 lines of code. It's about time to kind of retest the code, okay? Because I don't want to insert too much code before, you know, proceeding too, too, uh, too far forward. So in this code, we are basically moving 16. Oh, yeah, we are moving 16, which is the value of um, where the PTR is supposed to be pointing to into local variable of oh, the first element of array. So in the picture, okay, so this is why the picture is useful. <clears throat> so in the picture, what we should see is 16 being stored here because you know, this is the first element of the array. Is that making any sense? So we are expecting location FB to be changed to one zero. Now we know that one zero is fine because we just checked that earlier. The question is, am I computing the address correctly and stashing it to location FB so that it, you know, it updates that location? So now we run the code again. Okay, before that we have to save the code save and then run it again and if you debug your program step by step like this okay it each 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 step is not going to be too big of a deal okay so now we just have to look for the update okay indeed we are changing location fb to 10 which is our 16 so that is exactly what we expected to do, okay? So now we just move on to the next uh, line in C. <clears throat> so the next line in C is line 23, which is just adding one to um, I. So to do that, we do the same thing or something, very, something that is very similar. Uh, LDI, pick a register, let's say A, okay? Main underscore I add ad so now register a has the address of i but this time i don't want to destroy register a because i will need it back because in order to i need to both get the value of i so i can increment and then have to store that incremented value back to i so i really want to keep the address of i around for this operation if i could and i do have three registers so i can actually do this and then the next thing to do is to do LD B A. So the register B is the value of A, whereas register A is the address of I, and then register B is the value of I. Is that okay? All right. And then we do increment B, okay? In other words, we're just incrementing the value of I, but it is not stored back into I until we have the ST instruction. So now we store the incremented value back into I. So that should increment i, so that i goes from 0 to 1. All right, well, we debug the program, okay? We, we double check everything is as we expected. Now we go back to this picture and go like, okay, so what we are expecting, I'm going to use a different color, is this thing here at location fe should increment to a 1 at this point, okay? So that's what, I sh that's, that's what I'm expecting to see. Then we go back to this, make sure we save the program, and then run the program again. All right. So now we get back to the trace, and then we are looking for an update to a memory location. 
So the question is, are we supposed to update FE, location FE to 01? Let's look at the picture. This is location FE, which is corresponding to local variable I of main, and we are expecting it to up, update to a 1. Okay, very good. <clears throat> And now we get back to the implementation, take out the halt instruction, and now we are implementing the last item inside the while loop, which is probably one of the most confusing line of this entire program. But remember what I said, you evaluate one side at a time, okay? So you always evaluate the right-hand side, and then whatever it has, you, up, you use it to update the left-hand side. Now, both of them are referring to PTR, doesn't matter, okay? It, it does not matter at all. Okay, so now we have LDI, um, uh, we can use register A, main underscore PTR, so we get to the offset to the local variable PTR, at AD, we, now we have the address of PTR, but that is something, if I could save it, it would be useful because I need it back you know, on the left-hand side, so I would try my best to save it, okay? I would try my best not to reuse register A at this point because it is something that I really need to, you know, need to use again. <clears throat> so the next operation is the LDBA. So the register B is the value of PTR because now register B is the address of the beginning of a structure, okay? In other words, we have just the reference, the pointer. The next question is, um, but which member of the structure do we want to access? Oh, it's the, it's the member called next, okay? And fortunately, I have just enough registers to do this. So now I can load the offset from the beginning of the structure to member and next into register C. <clears throat> and then we add those two, and whichever way we add is fine, okay? So we can add, a, we can add EC, CB like this, so now register C becomes the address of member next of the structure that PTR is pointing to. <sighs> okay, but that's just the address of. This is not saying there's no ampersand here, which means, yeah, the address is good, but we need to know the value of that particular member, which means we need another dereference here. So now register C is the value of member next of the structure that PTR is pointing to. The right-hand side is done, and the result is in register C. <clears throat> and now we need to store that into you know, whatever P wherever PTR is. Guess what? I saved that register, okay? It is in register A, so at this point, I just have to say that. Are we okay so far? Yep. Oh, yeah, this should be. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and see what happens when I make your stupid mistakes like that. Okay. <clears throat> Which is not to say that this is okay, but the tool does catch that too. So, so I want to show you how. Yep. Uh, you're right. I forgot to save too. <laughs> there we go. It actually wouldn't be too hard for me to test, you know, whether I have saved the file because I can actually compare the last update of the source file versus the last update of the other files that it generates. So if the source file is still older than the files that it had generated from the previous one, then I know that this is probably not what I want to do. <clears throat> All right, so we did have a, a mistake here. And it says, you know, assembler finished validating object code. But this time, it says the source file did not assemble correctly. And it diverted me to go back. Okay, go read your source code and fix it. So if you are getting something like this, then you go back to the assembler and you go back to the source tab because all the errors are reported in the source tab. And you just have to kind of scroll down until you see something in column B. And it now says, you know, unresolved reference to the label main underscore next which is exactly what you mentioned earlier, that we, I used the wrong label. Okay, so now we go back here and then go fix that problem first. Okay, so that is here. <clears throat> there we go. And now we test it again, okay, because you know, the whole point is you know, I want to know whether we updated the program correctly or not. 
But this time, how do we know the program is working correctly? Okay. So this time it's a little bit more complex because I need to know where N2 is supposed to be, and the assembler, the assemble tab of the assembler can tell me that. So I, I need to look at N2. N2 is supposed to be at location FC. So we know that PTR should update to FC. So going back to the map that I drew earlier, um, so this means PTR, which is at location FA. So I'm going to pick another color again. And I'll pick this one. It means this time we're expecting this to change to the address of N2, which according to the assembler is supposed to be 0C. Zero, uh, zero there we go. Okay, so that's what we're expecting. So when you're debugging your program, you always need to know what the program is supposed to do so that you can compare whether your program is doing that or not. All right, so now that we have done this, we go back to the source code, make sure that, you know, okay, I, just, I think I just ran it, so I think we're good here. So go to the uh, analysis tab, and then we just look at the latest update, and it is changing FA to a content a value of FC. So when we go back here, yep, this is location FA, it is supposed to change to FC, so the program is still doing everything that it's supposed to be doing. Are we doing okay so far with this code? Okay. So now we look at this code and go like, okay, what else do we need to do? Well, not a whole lot. <clears throat> we are done with uh, line 22 to line 24. So what is left is the control structure. So now I can implement the control structure. And fortunately, I left behind your know, comments like this. So I know where is the beginning of the control structure and where the end is. So with this, I just have to say, okay, the other ways to say this is if PTR is null, go to end while. And we also need a label here. This is the beginning of the while loop. Okay, so we define a label here. And then at the very end, we got two things to do. The first thing you need to do at the end of a while loop is an unconditional branch back to the beginning. So this is going back to begin while, but we also need end while as a label to be defined here so that we can continue execution when the loop is all done. Is that okay? So I am really just adding, this is not a comment, but the other one is. So if I were to comment this using the um, process, okay, this really kind of is go to begin while be in while followed by the actual label of end while. So uh, the C code is very similar to the assembly code in this case. <clears throat> all right, but this program is not done yet because all of this is just comment. So the label definition in C is really kind of, it looks exactly the same in assembly, so we define the label here. And now we have to say, okay, how do we know whether PTR is null or not? Well, I guess we have to get to it, right? So LDIB with main PTR, uh, add BD, um, LDBB, and then we have to check whether it's a zero or not. Okay, so how, what is the quickest way to check whether a register is zero or not? Yep, and same, same answer, okay, very good. So that's what we're gonna do, okay? So we say and BB, oop, and BB, JZI, okay? And according to this, if it is zero, we are supposed to go to and while, so this time, eh, it's pretty easy. We just have to say, if we get the zero flag set after the end BB, we need to go to end while. Yep. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you're correct. So by the time we fall through to here, uh, look at line 53 to line 55 versus line 58 to line 60. Do they look the same to you? So the, the way the program is right now is not wrong. It is just not efficient, okay? It's just repeating. It's doing the same three lines without, you know, it doesn't have to do it. 
Now, if those three lines had a side effect, then I cannot just say, oh, we can just you know, get the other three out. But these three lines do not have any side effect other than, oh, let's make B the value of pointer. So that's why it's okay to comment out the other three. <clears throat> but the way you want to do it is to say, okay, let's not go for optimization yet. Okay, let's just check the program, make sure that it does work, and then we can come back and optimize. Okay, because optimization you know, can be tricky uh, sometimes. Okay, so the program is done. So now I can run the code. And we already know what is supposed to be in the array. So that's one thing that we can check to see whether the program works the way it's supposed to. <clears throat> All right. So now we switch back to the trace and then we examine the locations. Now, before we do this, we go to the map here because we know that we're supposed to have 16 in FB. Um, let me take a look at the code because I cannot remember the, the C code. <clears throat> so in the C code, um, if you remember earlier, we're supposed to, to see a five and then a two in the array. So that means, okay, let me pick yet another color green this time. So this time we should see a five here and a two over here. I should eventually change to a three when the whole program is done. And then PTR should become zero because that's the exit condition of the loop. Okay, is that okay? That's, uh, green is awful because it's, it's a lot darker on my screen than it is here, but can, can you guys all kind of read the green stuff? Kind of? Okay. Let me see if I can. Uh, uh, okay. I can try something that's a little bit easier. This is gray, darker gray. Oh, maybe this will work. Yeah, that's a darker green. Okay, let me. Is that working better? Okay, there we go. All right. So the point is, okay, you know, I need to know what the program is supposed to do before I go back to the trace, because otherwise, what, how are you going to know the program is working or not, right? This is also something that we saw in the C program in GDB, and that's why having the source code in C that compiles and runs, you know, in GDB is important because you're going to use GDB to understand by what step what is going to happen to which local variable, and so on. So now we switch back to uh, the trace, and we are just going to look for those things. So we look for the next update. FA gets FC. Okay, that one we anticipated and checked already. Um, FC gets a 0, 5. Okay, let's double check. So FC gets a 5. Okay, we're good. <clears throat> and then FE gets a 2. That's local variable I. Okay, so FE is local variable I. Eventually, it gets to 3, but it has to get to 3 through getting to 2 first. So we are good there. Um, FA is getting 0A, and that means you know, we are getting to N3 this time. Okay, so that's, that's good. And then we have another update to FD being 0, 2. Okay, so that's the, the last element of the array getting updated to a 2. That's all good. <clears throat> and then FE is getting a 3. This is the last value of I, the last update to local variable I. And then PTR is getting updated to a 0. So that's location FA getting a 0. Okay, it's getting a null pointer. So that means we are almost ready to get out of the loop. And the way we know whether it's getting out of a loop is the JZI. So if the JZI is branching, taking the branch, that means we're exiting the loop. And you can see how it went from line 56 to line 93. So we exited the loop. So now the rest is really just cleaning up the stack, you know, and getting returning back to main. Uh, excuse me, this is in main already, so we are returning to the entry point of the program, and then we halt. 
Oof, okay, so that's kind of the, the process of writing this program. So I'm not sure, is that helping you know, with your homework assignment? At least you're giving you an idea of how to tackle the problem. All right. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to the program that you're going to write because I have some suggestions of how to proceed with that one too. So let me get out of all of this and then go back to uh, the Traverse program that you are writing. <clears throat> And then what we do is, all right, so looking at this code, what are you going to do with Traverse? It is complex. It has a conditional statement. And inside here, we got stuff you know, that you have to implement. So the first thing I would do is to say, let's take out everything here, replace it with a single halt instruction. And then we'll use, we'll change the call, and we'll just say, okay, let's pass a null pointer. You know, and see whether it will ignore everything, do absolutely nothing, and then come back. Okay, because if it gets to the halt instruction inside the conditional statement, that means I'm not checking the condition correctly. Is that okay? So once that part is done, then we go into the conditional statement and go like, okay, that looks pretty awful with all that recursion stuff and whatnot. So instead of doing the recursion, take out the recursion. So take this out. Take that out. But in your original code, you know, this is not going to help you test anything. Because you know, if you are passing a null pointer, it will bypass the then statement of the conditional statement entirely. So what you would need to do in that case is to go like, okay, let's try this. But only with um, the function you know, uh, simplified like this. Now, you might ask, but I have no idea what this is supposed to be doing. Well, run this code in C first, okay? Find out how array pointer of main is getting changed, how it's getting changed. Find out how array is getting the first location or the first element initialized, okay? And then you know what your assembly code is supposed to do because your assembly code is really a mirror of the C code. So this, whatever the C code does, your assembly code should do exactly the same thing. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Now, with these, you can also do it one at a time, okay? Just do this one, okay? Find out how it is going to change the first element of array as a local variable in main um, using n 5 your value, okay? So you basically, you're just doing one thing at a time, just like what I did in class. If this works, then try to implement this one, which is going to increment array pointer of main. And that's why you see a double pointer, because it is a pointer to a pointer. So that means asterisk array is really referring to array pointer in main. That's how we pass those parameters. So the whole point is, do it in small steps, okay? And if you know how to use get, you know, GitHub, you utilize GitHub or just, you know, the get uh, command line tool, uh, it's going to be helpful too because every time the program works the way it's supposed to, you check in into the repository. So this way, you know, if you mess up the program for any reason, you have a place to fall back on. You go like, yep, I know the program used to at least do this part correctly, I just have to go back to that version and then start from there. Are there any questions about this whole thing? You know, how to approach the problem, the concept of accessing members of a structure, especially one that is pointed to by a pointer, um, how to use GDB, the differences between the local variable, between a local variable and a global variable, how we allocate for local variables, how we deallocate the local variables, how we call, how we return, how we pass parameters. All right. So I'm going to give you the code of LList, you know, the linked list program. So once again, this is an opportunity for you to document the program, okay, to comment, you know. Hopefully by this time you would have documented the other programs that I have you know, sent your way, 
And this time, you know, you only have to document the more tricky part of it and not the entire thing. Um, but when you take the final exam, you probably want to track every single you know, register as you go through that code. All right. Are we good so far? Are there any questions that I can answer before I stop the recorder? The recorder is still going. No questions. All right. Well, okay. So there's one more thing. Okay. We do have a lab today. And the lab today is, it's not too long. It should help you with your homework assignment. <clears throat> So let me get all the way down. It's called a uh, basic structures. So let me unhide it and then I'll show you the access code to it. Yeah, the access code is super boring. It's just struct. There we go. And you have until 120 today to kind of get it done. There are only six points, okay? Not a whole lot of point value. All right. If there are no further questions, I will stop the recorder and upload the video.